All right. So you can grab your seats. I'm going to use a corny line that Jeff Schwartz gave me. He gives me a lot of material lately. And we're off. Is that good? Not very good. Anyway, so we're going to have a little bit of a horse, horse talk from Rich. First of all, I want to thank uh, Rob and I want to thank Nick and uh, Sarah, who's not here, for helping with all the logistics that goes involved, that's involved with uh, having a lunch like this, ordering the food, setting up the chairs, um, everything. So thank you guys so much. Give it up for them, please. So I want to just welcome everybody to the New York Biz Lab. Um, I call this the most productive hour in New York, the New York's capital region. This is the most productive lunch hour. I think I heard some networking going on, good stuff happening. So thanks so much for coming. Who's here for the first time? Awesome. It's always great to see new faces. Great to see the Biz Lab community folks that are here too. I'm not going to name them all. There are a lot here. Um, I'm very excited for our speaker. It's uh, for the first time in a while. We've been doing interviews for a while, but this is going to be the first time we're going to have a lecture. Is that a good word for it, Rich? I'm sorry. <laughs> Rich gets very bored. But, you know, if Rich wasn't talking today, he would probably be here for about five minutes and then leave. We thought that he might actually finish his talk uh, from his cell phone and just kind of call in. But anyway, we're glad to have him here. I'll let Bela do the formal introduction, but I do want to say just a couple of quick things about Rich. Uh, when I became a reporter at the Business Review many years ago, and uh, one of my colleagues said, you've got to talk to Rich um, if you're going to cover the tech community, because Rich knows he's involved in every tech deal, all the deal flow. And so I wound up talking to Rich so much that like, she kind of hated me after that, because she couldn't really use him as much as a source. So um, anyway, so Rich has just knew everybody. Several people who couldn't make it today, I'd already told him that they already apologized that they couldn't be here because they're traveling or whatever, but um, Rich's impact has been significant. Um, it's also my pleasure to announce TransFinder is our meal sponsor today, so I want to thank them for covering the cost on that. Clarkson, obviously, is the overall event sponsor. Um, Transfinder, by the way, covers every single school. We make school bus routing software for every single school district in Schenectady County. So if you live in Schenectady County, you may have had a bus route that was designed by Transfinder. Little plug there in case Tony's listening. Um, all right. I want to thank our videographer, Richard Lynn of Agora Technologies. He does an awesome job. He also, all of his videos are on our YouTube page. Thank you so much, Richard. And also, we have another videographer here today with Channel Albany and Keith behind the camera over here. So thanks so much to both of you for being here and, and shooting that. Also, this is the dreaded housekeeping items that Bela referenced last, last month. The, what'd you call it? The, the, the bathroom announcements? The, yeah, thank you, toilet, it's even worse. Anyway, um, so the restrooms are behind you, behind that uh, exit door, um, exit sign back there. Um, there's exits all around if you need to leave here in a hurry. After listening to Rich, you want to place your bets. Today is a dark day of the track, by the way, so you can't place bets. Can you place bets today anyway? No? Not in Saratoga. Not in Saratoga. Well, yeah. Uh, you may hear some business happening because this is also a bank, uh, Saratoga National Bank, awesome neighbors here. So if you do hear business, that's a very good thing. Um, and if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag BizLabClarkson. Without further ado, please give it up for Bela, not you, Rich. You were very excited. Please give it up for Bela Musitz. Thanks, Rick. So uh, this is really sort of special for me because I get to introduce uh, not just a great person and a great lawyer, someone who has had a huge impact on the community here, but also someone who's a great friend. So uh, for me, this is really nice. Uh, I think most of you know uh, Rich Honan, and uh, let me just give you a little uh, indication of the impact that he and his law firms have had, uh, going back to Honan and Wood, and, and now Phillips Lytle. Uh, Commerce Hub, Fortitech, eTransmedia, X-Ray Optical, Informs, those are all companies that uh, he has been involved with over the years, and those are some of the big key successes that we have heard about here in this region. Uh, so he is a fabulous person, uh, a great attorney, uh, runs a great practice here in Albany at Phillips Lytle, and he owns racehorses. So we're going to hear about how the racehorse business works. And uh, I think hopefully uh, you will garner some very interesting entrepreneurial elements to that business and managing risk uh, that are part of all business owners. 
So with that, Rich, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bela. Thanks, Rick. And I know Tony's not here, but uh, thank you, Tony, for uh, for this program, which today accepted is usually has great speakers and, and lots of good things to hear. And uh, thank you guys for everything you do for, for the community. So we really appreciate it. So horse racing, you know, uh, how does it work and what does it teach us about entrepreneurialism and investing? Um, so big picture, horse racing is part of the agriculture industry. I, I really wanted to start off by saying agriculture is the third largest industry or something in New York State, and we actually found every other fact about it, but we can't figure out where it ranks. I do know there's seven million acres of farms, and that New York is number two in apples and snap beans when it comes to agriculture, <laughs> which made me pissed, so I had to go see who was number one. Anybody know? Wisconsin. Uh, uh, Washington for, no, uh, for beans, Wisconsin. And anyway, uh, uh, so horse racing is, is part of that, of that big umbrella uh, of agriculture. It's about uh, a $3 billion a year industry in New York State. Uh, it's about 12 to 13,000 permanent employees and other, uh, what they call direct employees, and about another 7,000 indirect employees. And any of you uh, who have been in Saratoga, the, the town of Saratoga in the summer, you could obviously see the effect that horse racing has on you know, the surrounding businesses and, and things like that. So horse racing in uh, New York is run by uh, a, a number of agencies, but the people who run the tracks is Naira, the New York Racing Association. And they run the three big uh, horse racing tracks, Saratoga, Belmont, and Aqueduct. Um, and the, the way it works is right now, as you know, the horses and everybody are here are, are up at Saratoga. When Saratoga ends, everybody moves down to Belmont, uh, and they run there throughout the fall, and then they move to Aqueduct, and they run there throughout the winter, and then in the spring, back to Belmont, and then back to Saratoga. And when I say everybody, I mean all the horses, all the trainers, all the jockeys, all the people who work on the horses, the exercise riders, a lot of the people who serve the food and take the bets. It's just one big traveling circus Go, goes all the way around. Um, and that's just, that's the track that they make. So when people say, oh, you own horses, where's your, where's your horse? Well, right now, my horse is in Saratoga, uh, along with the trainer. Um, we're lucky to be, Saratoga, obviously, the, the track is the jewel of, of Naira. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the most famous, it's a famous racetrack nationally, probably internationally. Uh, you probably know Saratoga started way back, the first race was August of 1863. And uh, which I think is pretty, I was looking at the mural back there, there's, the, the, there's a whole mural here of kind of the, you know, the, the historical, and I'm looking at the, the Civil War guys and the guy in the blue hat could have fought the Battle of Gettysburg and then a month later could have been at Saratoga for the first race. That's how far back it goes. Um, and there's an entrepreneurial aspect to Saratoga because the guy who started it was a guy named John Morrissey. He was a corrupt Democratic politician uh, I know, it's a, <laughs> a number of redundant terms, uh, uh, but he had part of the Tammany Hall kind of uh, 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 Democratic Party. He, I think he was a congressman, congressman from New York City. He was also a, 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 a prize fighter. He was like, you know, the, like the bare knuckle kind of prize fighter. He was a champion prize fighter. He was an entrepreneur and he started, uh, among many things, he started a casino in Saratoga where people from New York City and other places would come up and spend money at night. He later sold that casino to a guy named Thomas Canfield, and to this day, it's still, yes, it's still called the Canfield Casino, and it sits there, and you can still go to events there, it sits there in Congress Park in, uh, in, in Saratoga. Um, but he needed something for his patrons to do during the day, and so they started a horse track. And he got together with his friend William Travers, if that's a name that sounds familiar to you, there's a, a race named after him, and his other friend, um, uh, August Belmont, there's a track named after him as well. And they started the Saratoga, basically the Saratoga Racing Association. The first, uh, the, the first time there were four days in the meet. And in those days, the horses would run, you, would ha you had to win heats. So the horses would run a mile and then, that, and then they'd have another race where they'd run another mile and then whoever won like two out of three won, okay? That's, 
when horses were horses. Uh, and these days, it, it, it would be, it's odd for, you know, a, a, a long race is a mile and a half, and then you have, you know, six weeks off to, to rest after that. So that, that's, that's what goes on in Saratoga. Can I just maybe ask this? How many people have actually been to the track at Saratoga? Okay, so just about everybody. Um, so th that's how it works. So the horses at Saratoga, now obviously some of them cost millions of dollars, okay? You know, just bought by rich people and, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're as weanlings or as yearlings, uh, they're purchased for millions. But there's a lot of horses on the track at Saratoga where they were bought for between, say, 20,000 20, and maybe $90,000, which is a lot of money, but, you know, much different from millions and millions. And those horses are owned by small partnerships uh, that will run, will, that form really the bulk of most of the ownership. And that's one of the, that's why they asked me to come speak here, because I'm, I'm in one of them. Um, and so my, my still best friend, uh, who uh, um, was my college roommate, um, and, uh, and when, the reason I say still best friend is when we, Graduated from college, he was going to law school, but he couldn't write his, his entrance essay, so he asked me to write it for him. And then he said, why don't you write one too for yourself? So I did, we both got in, and then he left six weeks later uh, and stuck me with, with the apartment on Dana Avenue. And he went off to become a seven-figure a year CEO, and I remained a lawyer. But we, we remained friends. And we, and we used to go to the track every year, and and we, we'd watch the horses getting saddled in the paddock and said, wow, that, you know, one day we're going to own a horse. So about, uh, we were like 45 at some point, and I called them up, and I said, you know, a lot of people our age are dead now. So it's, if we're going to do this, we've got to do it now. And so we got, and that's how we got, and that's how a lot of people get involved. We found a trainer. Our trainer is named Rick Schausberg. These are the people who, obviously, they take care of the horses, they prepare them uh, for, for the track, and they also, importantly, help you buy the horse. Uh, and uh, th there's a lot of good ones. We found them through somebody we knew. And uh, you know, one of the pieces of advice I always give my entrepreneurs when they're seeking investment, I, you know, I say, you know, if you have an investor and you can't stand to have a drink with them, they probably shouldn't be an investor, okay? So we were able to have a drink with Rick. Uh, and uh, and he, we said, we're going to have a million questions. And he, and he said, fine. So, uh, we found him, and we went and bought a horse, and uh, I think the first one cost in the neighborhood of, say, $40,000, okay? It was us and, and some other people. Uh, and most of these are formed as LLCs, by the way. The, the lawyer in me says, you know, I have to tell you that. Um, on the expense side, so the horse, sta as I said, the horse stays with the trainer uh, and, you know, throughout the circuit. On the expense side, bottom line is we assume that a horse is going to cost about four grand a month four grand a month per horse, you know, to keep it in, you know, hay and, you know, shoes and teeth, it's like kids, shoes and teeth and uh, um, some medications. Uh, and and um, it, obviously sometimes there, there's other expenses, but like say when we buy a horse uh, and we'll go to our partners and say we're looking for a horse for $40,000, we also escrow four months of, uh, of expenses, okay? If, if, the, if we can't produce after that, we'll, we'll usually sell the horse. Uh, or, you know, or move on. So th that's how it works, okay? So that's, that's the cost side. So you could buy a horse for as little as twenty dollars or $30,000, and obviously you could spend millions. Um, you could buy a horse for eighty dollars or $90,000. Some, sometimes you'll buy them at the sales. You've heard of the famous Fazig Tipton sales. There's the million-dollar sales, but then there's the New York bred sales, and you could buy horses for seventy or eighty or $90,000, and we've done that. There's other sale places throughout the country. Um, so that's how you spend money. The way you make money, hopefully, is that there's, there's purses, okay? So if you ever go to Saratoga and you say, well, this, this race, there's a $40,000 purse, okay? What we do with that purse is the winning horse gets, the winning owner gets 60%, second place is 20%, third place is 10%, fourth place is 5%. So fourth place, if you bet on the horse, you haven't made any money, but the owner is still making 5% of the purse. So fourth place is better than, you know, better than sixth. Fifth place gets uh, three, 3%, and then the remaining horses all split the remaining 2%. So um, if it's a $40,000 race and you have your, your horse and you come, in, you come in third, which 
It isn't bad. You know, there's times when you'll take third. If, if you really thought you were going to win, then you'll be disappointed. But to actually get a horse to the racetrack, have them get into the starting gate, complete the race, and then get a check afterwards is not bad. Horse comes in third, we get 10%, that's $4,000. 10% of that goes to the trainer, 10% of that goes to the jockey, and we're left with $3,200, which you know, keeps the horse in hay for a month. You know, that, that's not an awful day for us. Um, what you might want to think about is, except for the big Breeders' Cup type races, so these jockeys, a lot of times, even if they win that race, what are they going to get, $2,400? It's not bad, okay? But there's races where they get a few hundred dollars. And these are, this is for, you know, a jockey weighs 110 pounds. They're riding a 1,500-pound horse up at 40 miles an hour with one hand, right? Because they're holding, holding the whip in the other among 10 other horses. Uh, sometimes it's raining. Sometimes there's mud. You know, you've seen them. They have the, the, um, the goggles. They'll have five sets of goggles that they pull down. As, as the goggles get filled with mud, they pull them down. You see them after the race, they have them all hanging. They used to throw them, but I guess they felt that was bad. Um, so these guys might get $400 for doing that. All right, so next time you talk about you know, overprivileged athletes, the, these guys are not. Um, so, so, that's how, so that's how hopefully you make money. Everybody with me so far? I guess it's not a, it's not a Q and A. All right. <laughs> Where is Rick? Rick, did Rick already leave? Okay. Rick, you're, you're gonna let me know when I run out of time, right? Okay, like two more minutes? We're, okay, yeah. He's, he's like on the phone. Uh, the, the next thing is actually getting the horse in a race. So the whole idea is they try, there's somebody called the racing secretary, and they're the ones who make up the races. And the whole idea is you want to try and get hor horses of like abilities in the same race. You don't want a really good horse running against a lot of really bad horses. It's not fun. It's not great for the horses. It's, it's, you, you try and get it as equal as possible. And there's really only a few variables when you're riding a race. There's long races and short versus short races. Anything up to a mile is considered a sprint. Above a mile, it's considered a longer race. There's races on the, on the, uh, on the dirt, you know, the actual track. And then there's races on the turf, on the grass that's on the inside. There's races for, you know, there's boy horses and girl horses. So there's races for males and females. Uh, there's New York breads versus open company. So th those are kind of the variables. Um, and then there's usually what you start with is at how much the race is worth. So they, th right now there's a book that anybody can get that tells you what the next two weeks of races are going to be in Saratoga. So we'll have a horse and we'll say, okay, there's a race coming up next Thursday and it is for, it, it's a seven furlong race for fillies and mares three years old, you know, a, a three-year-old female horse. Um, and as, and it, it pays $40,000, and it's for horses who have never won a race before. That's another big condition. Horses who have never won races, referred to as maidens, um, get special races. Then once a horse wins, there's races where you say, well, you can't be in this race if you've won, won more than one race, or more than two races, or three. So those are the conditions. All makes sense so far. The thing that blows everybody away is the concept of claiming races. Does anybody have you, first of all, does anybody know what they are? Claiming races? Have you heard the, heard the phrase? Okay. Um, this sounds kind of nuts, okay, but a claiming race means that anybody, any owner or any uh, uh, trainer at the track, if a horse is in a claiming race, you can buy that horse. You can, you can walk into the racing office two minutes before the race, up to two minutes before the race, and say, I'm going to buy, I'm, I'm going to claim horse number three. And the, and the race is written with a claiming price. So next time you go, you know, and it says, you know, $45,000, fillies and mares or something, it'll, the first thing it'll say is claiming. It might say allowance, it might say stakes. Usually, most of the races in America are claiming races. It'll say claiming, and then it'll say the claiming price, $40,000. You went to your horse in that race, and you are taking the chance that anybody, any other owner, can buy that horse for $40,000, okay? Which is kind of weird. Uh, and so um, you'll find out, you, you make that decision two minutes before, which kind of gets us into the idea of, of, first of all, does everybody get that, just by the way? Now, the idea is supposed to be that, uh, you know, Bela put it really well. You don't have D1 athletes uh, competing against D3 athletes, okay? Because you could, 
when you read the program, you could say, oh, this horse cost $200,000 at the Saratoga sale last year, and now they're running the horse for $40,000. Um, or you say, this horse you know, has never won, I can understand why they're running it for $40,000. But a lot of times, what do you do with that $250,000 horse that suddenly is in a $40,000 claiming race? So you could, we could go buy it if we want, yeah. and we could say, wow, this is great, we can get a $250,000 horse for 40 grand. And of course, then you start thinking, well, why would they do that? Why would somebody take, you know, lose $210,000 worth of value? Um, there's got to be something wrong with the horse. And now, nobody would run a horse that is unsound, okay? They, nobody knowingly does that. Um, but sometimes, you know, listen, the horse is going to be fine, but it's going to have a knee or a shoulder or an ankle or a stifle or, you know, you know a hock or whatever these parts of horses are. Uh, and um, and you, you know there's going to be an issue. So you say, yeah, I want to get rid of the horse. The problem is they know, the, the owner of that horse knows what we're thinking. And he or she might be thinking, you know what, I'm going to run this $250,000 horse in a $40,000 claiming race. I'm going to put bandages on the front and back legs of the horse. And so everybody thinks I'm trying to hide something. And who knows, maybe I pick up a nice $40,000 purse, I retain my horse, and I got a quick win. And of course, we're thinking now, do you think he really <laughs> means to lose the horse? So that's how it goes. Uh, it's usually close. Okay. It, it's usually, the question was, is the size of the purse and the size of the, the claim, they're, they're usually pretty close. Um, and, and there's some other rules, which I won't get, yeah, from the pregnancy row. <laughs> I, I, I was sitting in a row, it was, it was me and two other, two pregnant, I shouldn't say two other, two pregnant women. So I, I, I asked if I was, I used to see, Julie, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong row. Okay, now go ahead. <laughs> Good. So the, did you hear the question? If, if the horse gets claimed, um, but the horse wins the race, who gets the purse? I should have said that. I, no, thanks for bringing that up. The original owner, the old owner, gets the purse. Okay? Um, so what you by the way, when you claim a horse, you're really hoping the horse comes in second. Because one, it means the horse probably doesn't suck. And two, it means that the horse has, has now not... Remember I said there were some races where if you, if you won two races, you can't be in that race? The horse has now not satisfied that condition. You could run that horse back in the, in the same kind of race. So the answer is the old owner gets the purse, okay? It used to be, up until fairly recently, no matter what happened to the horse, you bought the horse. So tragically, if, you, if the horse broke down, you were the proud owner of this horse that you know, was no longer alive. Um, this is the new owner. Fortunately, they changed that rule. Um, it's still pretty. It's still pretty tight. I think if you claim a horse and the horse has to be vanned off, it, you know, actually has to be taken off, which doesn't always mean that the horse is going to die. By the way, a lot of times it just means we're being careful. You then have 30 minutes to have your vet look at the horse. And yeah, I know it's quick, right? Um, you have 30 minutes to decide whether you want to proceed with the claim. But that's a long answer to, to your question. Um, so, the. All right, there's something else I'm going to say, but uh, I'll, I'll just add on to that. So, um, so the, the claiming game is where most people buy their horses. And here's where we get into kind of the due diligence of it. So we, we found our trainer, Rick Schossberg, and we said, okay, we have $40,000, go get us a horse. You read the racing form, just like everybody else. You read the racing form, you say, oh, there's a, there's a claiming race next Tuesday, and you look through everything. You know, there's, there's this much inf information, right? The horse has probably run four times, and you say, yeah, you know, the horse looks pretty good. So you spend, you know, eight minutes reading that. Uh, then your trainer will try and find out something from the other trainer. Uh, say, hey, listen, I know, I see you have a horse in for a tag. They call it in for a tag. Uh, you have a horse in for a tag. Anything I should know, you know, I have a good set of owners, you know. Um, you now, trainers don't always love losing horses. Sometimes they're thrilled to get rid of the horse. But a lot of, you know, they make money through horses. So there's that. And then there's the final part of the due diligence. And, and I think the lesson here is that you have to, your due diligence has to fit your situation. You know, all my friends, and, and Dick, you and I, talk, I think the last time we talked about this, I was like, oh, all you VC guys are like, oh, yeah, it's going to take me three months of due diligence. When we buy a sixty or $80,000 horse, um, we're not, you're allowed to watch the horse walk from the barn to the paddock. 
You're not even allowed in the paddock. The paddock is that area in the middle where they saddle the horses. If you're gonna claim a horse, you're not allowed in the paddock. So I'm standing, this just happened to us on Sunday. We, went, we tried to claim a horse. Um, I'm standing with my, with, with my trainer and we're just standing by the fence. And first of all, he's on the phone. And finally, my friend was like, hey, Rick, do you mind getting off the phone and looking at the horse that we're trying to buy? And I swear he went like this. So the, the fence is here, we're standing, he goes like this. Okay, let's buy it. <laughs> now, sometimes he, he does that and he says, no, we're not gonna buy it. And then he explains, it's, it's really cool because like every other expert in the world, they see things that you and I just don't see. You know, he'd be like, oh, the left hock was a little bit misshapen. I was like, what, where's the hock again? Because <laughs> on horses, everything, like what you think is a knee in a horse is actually their ankle, and what you think is their ankle is actually their heel. It, it, everything is like one, one joint off from what, from what you think it is. Um, but that's the amount of due diligence you do, which is the other lesson, by the way, for entrepreneurs is, you know, for us as entrepreneurs, we try and think, I know everything, I control everything. You really have to get good at delegating not only responsibility but delegating decision making that's the hard part you know i you know my, my friend you know has been a ceo forever i've been in management positions in law firms for a long time um and i'm very comfortable with delegating there are those who say i over delegate uh, but um you, you got to be comfortable with that yeah because you know nothing about this you know he's he, somebody points and says well that ankle's a little swollen so you, that that's kind of a lesson for entrepreneurs um, and then you go ahead and either you buy the horse or don't. One final thing on that, because it's Saratoga, everybody wants a horse. So this particular horse that we tried to buy, seven other owners and trainers tried to buy it. So there were eight claims on that horse. Um, so the way they resolve it, and this is like charmingly low tech, everybody goes into the racing office after the race, okay? And the horse did okay. I think, I think the horse came in second actually. Like, it, the horse did exactly what everybody wanted it to do. It ran well, came in second. Um, and it was really cheap. It was like a $16,000, which is, you know, that, that's an inexpensive horse. And they basically, they write the names of each of the, of each of the claimants on a piece of paper, like on an index card. And they turn the card over and they put a number on it, okay? And then they put dice in a cup. And they shake the cup. And the, it's actually called a shake. So you'll say, oh, there was, you know, a three-way shake, a seven-way shake, and there was an eight-way shake. And they shake it, they go like that, it was number eight, they turned it over, and it was Gulo, I think it was. I'm trying to remember who the, the, the owner and the trainer was. Um, and I remember Linda Rice was, like, sitting right next to me, and she was like, ah, oh, damn it, you know, because it was just a horse he didn't get. And that's, that's how they resolve it. Um, the other, the trainers will also, the, the trainers will also usually put hundred dollars, they'll each put hundred dollars into a pot and then the winner gets, gets that. And the joke is that's, you know, to pay the vet bills for the horse. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the rudiments of it. Uh, the, um, what I can tell you is, um, like other things that you do in life, you know, if you're just doing it for the money, well, especially this, if you're just doing this for the money, don't do it. Right. Um, I, we've actually been pretty lucky. Um, we put in money whenever, 15 years ago, and haven't had to put much more in. Um, because, you know, when you do win, you know, if you win a $60,000 race and, you know, 60% of that, you know, that buys a lot of hay. Um, and, and so we've had some luck and we've been really good at looking at, at, at listening to our trainer. Even now that, you know, we've been doing it for long enough that, you know, we don't ask as dumb questions like what's the difference between straw and hay, which I think was the first thing I asked him and I think he almost gave us our money back. But, the, uh, you know, but we've, so we've done okay. Um, and, but you have, to, you have to like more than just the money, just like in the jobs that we all have right now. And the benefits are, you know, with your owner's card, you know, besides free parking, what you can do is go in the mornings and watch the horses work, work out. And has anybody ever done that? Just gone to track of it? Yeah, okay, everybody has. So you've all seen it. You know, it's, it's amazing. You know, it, 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 for me, I'm at the stage now where that's actually more fun for me than going to the races um, because uh, for those of you who have, try and find a way of doing it. Find somebody and have them take you back. Yeah, Dick. Just a quick question. For most of the syndicates, how many horses do they own? Uh, the question was, for most syndicates, how many horses do they own? So we're, for, we're pretty small. Um, for a long time, we owned like, you know, a, a lot of them own one or two horses, okay? And we call it a syndicate, but, you know, it's four friends who got together and said, yeah, you know, all right, $12,000 each. We'll take a shot. 
You know, it's kind of like owning restaurants. Everybody likes to say they own a horse. You know, I, I guess, you know, I got a seat in the restaurant. Um, and, and so, but some of them, like we have five right now. Um, and, uh, and some of them, the really big ones, like West Point is probably the biggest one. Jeff, you know, you know those guys real well. Um, and, and by the way, the person here who knows more about all this than me is Jeff, is Jeff Schwartz, my, my law partner. So he will correct everything I've said after this in a, in a short follow-up. Uh, the, uh, but like West Point has, you know, hundreds, you know, hundreds of, it, 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 that's, you know, they, it's just a different thing. But most of them, you know, we have probably, we probably have 20 people. I mean, some people are in for a thousand dollars, you know what I mean? Um, but anywhere from four to 20, let's say. Um, and that's why, by the way, if you ever go to the paddock in Saratoga and sometimes there's 400 people standing around a horse, that's why. Because there's 20 people and they've all brought, you know, their friend, you know, their, you know, and and their their mom and everything. So, that's you know, that's pretty cool. Um, Rich, the, yeah. How often can your horse run? Ah, uh, good question. The question was, how often can the horse run? If everything's good and everything's healthy and everything's sound, you might try and get your horse to. We like every three weeks, let's say. You know, uh, some there's some trainers who could run a horse every two weeks. Some, some horses can only run once, you know, once a month. We, it, pretty much every three weeks is what we look for. So at Saratoga, if it, like we had a horse that just did awful, but we had a horse that just ran on Sunday, and the good news is the horse, you know, he'll be able to run again you know, at Saratoga. Um, and that's, you know, that is one of the things, uh, it, it, let me just finish the other part, is so you have to enjoy the other, the other stuff, the non-money stuff. So you know, go to the track in the morning. I, you know, I love it if you, you, know, there's, you go to the track at five in the morning, there's a hundred horses on the track, all working out at various speeds, you know, all being ridden by you know, these exercise riders who are like 80 pound women who are just muscling these horses around. And, you know, the steam's coming off the horses and it's, it, it's, it's really cool. Um, so that's a fun thing to see. So you have to like that part of it. And I, I like still just going into the paddock and, you know, while they're saddling the horses, you know, talking to the jockeys and, stuff, and you know, walk, sometimes we walk the horse onto the track. Um, so the problem is the horses can't always run every three weeks. And that's the thing you got to be, you got to be ready for. And that I think is kind of the final, um, is Rick giving me the sign yet? Okay. Oh. Um, one of the things I'll say is, you know, bad things happen. Not terrible things, but you know, they're, you know, the horses get hurt, and they get hurt in every way you could think. You know, we've had horses. I, I, we had a horse actually step on a rock like a pebble, and you know, came came up lame. We had a horse who what banged his head on the top of his stall, and I, was, I don't know. Do horses have concussions? But we we, we didn't feel comfortable. You know. Um, so you have that, and then you have you know lots of terrible things that could happen, and then they're just you know they're athletes like everything else. Plus they're tremendously inbred, right? So they're they're fragile. Plus if you ever look at the physics of, you know a, you know 1,400 pound horse running at 40 miles an hour, and you know the smallest bone in, in his body is basically the ankle, you know the seismoid or something like that. That's a lot of force, and a horse you know comes all the way off the ground when it runs. So a lot of bad things could happen. And also they're also banging the hell out of each other. When, if you ever watch, I mean, there's a lot of contact. I mean, they're just hitting each other and, you know, kicking and stuff. Yeah. How's it decided what jockey rides what horse? And how many times a day can they ride? Uh, the question was, how do you decide what jockey uh, and how many times a day can they ride? The jockeys will ride every race if they can, okay? Um, and the, uh, which is weird. You'll see a guy win the Travers, you know, for $3 million. And then, he'll, you know, and then he'll run, you know, a, you know, a $40,000 allowance race, you know, when everybody's walking home. Um, the, the jockeys are usually affiliated with, with trainers, you know, so, you know, uh, you know, J.R. Velasquez may, may ride for Todd Pletcher, but if they're free, they will ride for you. And in fact, they're pretty entrepreneurial too, because you'll be at the barn in the morning and the jockeys will come around in a little cart and sometimes say, Hey, you know, do you need anybody today? Do you, do you, you know, um, and sometimes, and sometimes there's a conflict. We had, we had a, a jockey, I think it was J.R. who was going to, J.R. Velasquez, great jockey. Uh, he was going to ride one of our horses, and then Pletcher, uh, Todd Pletcher, a, a much bigger outfit than us, entered a horse. So he said, "I'm sorry, I have to, I have to get off. You know, I have to get off the horse." Which, you know, you want to feel, you want to get mad about, but you really can't. Um, I will say, I think it was in that race, his horse reared up in the paddock. He got thrown off, didn't get hurt, but his horse got scratched, and I think we came in second. So, uh, yeah, question back there. Yeah, so the ongoing costs, you know, 
Yeah, the, the four thousand a month will will do, you know feed and you know uh, and, and most most of the uh, you know there's a lot of medications. Um, they take you know they there's. Um, you know, there's, there's Lasix, which is the anticoagulant. You know, that's one of the, the bad things. You know, horses bleed when they run, all right? There's a lot of air going through, going through their, their nostrils and their lungs, and it actually causes blood. And if it gets really bad, the horse, you know, the horse can't run. It doesn't kill them, but, you know, imagine it's like you running being congested. So you take Lasix, um, or you give the horse Lasix, which is, is a coagulant and stops, stops them from bleeding. That's one of the things, there's a bill right now in, in Congress where they're trying to, to make this all uniform. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the questions is, should we stop giving horses Lasix, for example, because um, maybe, maybe you're giving them drugs that are making them kind of run beyond what they should be doing. So that's, anyway. So Lasix is, is a big drug. They take naproxen. They actually take naproxen, like Aleve. Like I, I was once, I was at the barn once, and my back was hurting, and my trainer said, here, you want a pill? And he gave me, a, literally, he gave me a horse pill of naproxen. <laughs> it was like this big. Um, and sometimes uh, there are, but you know, four grand a month takes care of most of it. Sometimes there's a procedure that uh, somebody will, first of all, you only, we almost always geld our horses. Um, sorry, but uh, you know, we don't have the million dollar horses, you know, it, it, and, and uh, uh, one, it makes them easier to handle. But the other reason why you geld a horse is apparently they get too, um, they get too muscular. Uh, if you don't, and and it and, and the, having for them to have muscles up front actually can upset their gait. So at least that's what they say. Um, the, yeah. Uh, let me just so every once in a while there's a big operation, and I will say one thing: whenever one of our horses gets hurt, even if we know the horse is going to race again, we always pay for the operation. We we get the horse you know stable. The horse could probably not run again, but they could still, you know, be a horse. Our trainer is the head of the New York State um, Retirement, uh, what's it called, New York State Retirement Association? I forget the name of it, Jeff. Uh, what? No, it's not the Thoroughbred Association. There's not like a Thoroughbred, it's a re, the Thoroughbred Retirement Association or something. And he, he's in charge of, of, who find like homes for these racehorses. So we, you know, we had a great horse that got hurt, uh, spent 15000 to, you know, on his operation, then gave it to a little girl on a farm in Kentucky and, you know. She sent us a picture of him with like, you know, ribbons in his name and stuff like that. I'm sorry, there's a question. Yeah, Ken. The question was, can you get insurance? Not for horses, not, not for a horse, you could, but it would be prohibitively expensive to insure a $90,000 horse, okay? You insure the big horses, you know? Um, and you could get, in, for the really big horses, you could also get insurance, you could actually get fertility insurance. Um, so if you have, you know, a stallion that ends up not being a stallion, um, you could actually insure against that. And one aside on that, the insurance, so the insurance will cover a horse that can't perform. A couple of years ago, I don't know what year this was, Fusiat, Fusiachi Pegasus, a uh, Japanese horse, I think, that won the Kentucky Derby. And they uh, syndicated it in Japan for millions of dollars. And the horse did not perform, did not, as they say, did not cover his mares. Okay, and they went to get insured, and it turned out that the horse, he could perform, but he was not interested. So he was a, an equine leader in the LGBT community, and so he was fine, and they didn't get the insurance. Uh, and there's some really funny scenes of like a lot of Japanese guys in, in white lab coats trying to like figure this out. Um, so the answer is you don't insure horses at, at you know at our level. They're the really big horses. You, you might. Um, one thing. I, one other thing I do want to say. Uh, I, you know, I said a couple of things on the entrepreneurial side. Uh, you know, you know, listening to people and things like that. I, I really think one thing. I'll, 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 all right, go ahead. What's the biggest race you've ever won? The biggest race we ever won was a couple of years ago. In Saratoga, we won a, a race called the With Anticipation. It was a $200,000 race. Uh, and, it, and we won it with a two-year-old filly who was in her second race. Somewhere, Alyssa, you might have seen this, somewhere, uh, hopefully not on YouTube, my, my friend, who, uh, my friend Michael, who, who my still best friend, uh, he's about 6'2", 6 6'3". 6 um, at the end of the, there's a, somebody was filming us watching the race, and at the end of it, Michael, basically jumps and mounts me, okay? Uh, and and uh, so that, that was, yeah, that was the pretty, and both my kids were there that day too. So that's the other thing. When you actually, uh, when you win a race, I've, I've told people winning a race 
is uh, being in the winner's circle at Saratoga with your kids, it's one of the very few experiences in life that is as good as you anticipated it to be. And it's, you know, it's just a remarkable experience. Now, sometimes you don't win. Most of the times you don't win. I think the lesson there is we as entrepreneurs, we think that our job is to control everything, to control the world. You know, we, we're going to control things. We're not going to let it, you know, we're, we're going to have everything planned out. You know, one thing this teaches you is, you know, these are horses. You can do everything right. You know, you do everything right, you, you find the right horse, you find the right rate, you train it the right way, you find the right race, you get a good draw on what, you know, what uh, uh, part, what, what's the word? What, po the, po thank you, what post, see Jeff? What post position you have, right? Um, you come around the final turn and you're perfectly positioned and the horse just doesn't fire. And you know, you ask the jockey afterwards, the jockeys who are all, most of them are Hispanic and they're all bi and trilingual. Um, and you'll, although I've noticed when they lose, they're, they, they're a lot less fluent than, and so like, when they lose, you know, I'll be like, Louis, you know, Luis, what happened? He's like, ah, she didn't want to, didn't want to run, you know, and you know, when they win, it's like, oh, the horse broke alertly from the first post and then moved up. Um, but it, my point is you do everything right and it just doesn't work. And, as, and, and so you start, uh, you know, we think as entrepreneurs, we're supposed to control everything. And it's a really good lesson that, you know, you have to have some humility in the face of the universe, okay? The universe is what we live in. It's not what we control. Uh, and I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the best lessons I learned from that. I would, you know, pass it on to all of you. And with that, that's all, oh, that's all I got. Okay. Now, it's, somebody has to ask this question. Okay, so, in, in your case with horses, you've been very you know, smart and fortunate to Lucky. have success. Um, but when you entered this agreement, did you set parameters for which you would all decide, like, you know, we've put too much money in, we're not putting it out, unless it's full, or even down to have you reevaluated? Did you look at it as a group of horses, or did you look at it as a group of individual horses? And like... So the question is, when, when you do your agreement, like how do you, how do you plan for it if things don't work out? I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because I'm a lawyer, my friend isn't, and I wrote the LLC agreement, it was like three pages long, and he had like seven pages of things that he wanted to add in, you know? And I was like, Michael, you know, if, if, the, horse, if the horse doesn't work, well, you just get rid of the horse, yeah. you know? I mean, you, and um, we actually have our LLC agreement, we have one agreement, and we have a separate exhibit A for each horse. So we might have 20 partners and like four of them will own horse A and five of them will own horse B. But basically, we leave everything up to the managing partner, my friend, Michael, and, you know, we, and everybody who buys in just, just knows that. And, you know, they trust him and he usually, he always does the right thing. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much. <laughs> Give it up for Rich. Thank you. Before you go. Rich. Biz Lab, Clarkson, Tumblr. Thank you very Give much. It up. Thanks so much, Rich. Thank you. I should mention Rich is my friend too. Bela said that I was a little more like, you know, professional, but Bela was one, I mean, uh, Rich was one of our very first advisors in the biz lab and he's been an advisor to me uh, ever since I first called him. So thanks again, Rich, that was awesome. I know there's a million questions. You don't have any plans, there. there's no track today, so you're good. All right, so um, thanks again everybody for coming. I wanted just a couple quick things. I uh, want to thank uh, Richard Lynn again and also Channel Albany for shooting this. Uh, we are looking for meal sponsors. We are also looking for video sponsors. So if you're interested in learning more, come and ask me. Quick reminder, there is no Biz Lab Clarkson lunch next month, August. Can I hear it? Oh, like you're going to be... Thank you very much. But we return in September. So September 19th, it's going to be another very unique um, event. It's always... Usually it's the third Thursday of the month. We had to do it differently for Rich because everything with Rich has to be different. But um, so Thursday, September 19th, it's going to be the co-directors of MOPCO. So that's Kat, Kat Coppett and Michael Burns. And it's going to be extremely unique, very professional, very practical, and very memorable. So with that said, thanks again so much for coming. Hope you have a great rest of your summer.